Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's DCRI Research Conference. It's a real pleasure today to introduce Dr. Matt Brennan. Um, throughout all sectors of society these days, there's a lot of promise for what big data may do to improve our lives and efficiencies. And in an area close to our hearts, clinical research, there certainly is a lot of promise for applying big data to leverage existing tools and resources to make trials more efficient, reach more patients, and evaluate more potential therapies. However, there's a number of challenges, and today we'll hear from somebody who's working actively and trying to help us understand some of those challenges. Matt came to Duke in 2006 for his cardiology fellowship, um, where he also trained in interventional cardiology, as well as earning an MPH in epidemiology from UNC prior to joining faculty in 2011. Since that time, he's been very active, prolific, over 50 publications uh, in uh, review articles, primary manuscripts, book chapters, and has been very well funded, including um, work with the STS registry, um, a PCORI study has, uh, is leading that focuses on patient perspectives for therapies for aortic valve replacement. And because of his interest in sort of this device space, he has uh, a number of sources of funding, including NIH, Burroughs Welcome, and um, the FDA to evaluate admin data for outcomes and some of the liabilities as we think about leveraging this data to make trials more efficient. So please join me in welcoming Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Abdul, and thank you uh, to everybody in the audience who's here and, uh, and who have been a part of the teams that uh, generated a lot of the data that we'll talk about today. So um, we will try and get through, maybe there's a hold on this. We'll try and get through 50 slides, which is quite a bit, if, uh, if the button works. Maybe I'll use the thing we frozen. So today we're going to talk. Today we're going to talk about administrative claims for clinical research. And as Uptal was saying, there's a lot of interest in our field of how to harness existing sources of data for more efficient uh, observational clinical uh, trial uh, protocol surveillance, all sorts of purposes. And we're going to uh, examine. I've spent a lot of my time over the last several years examining. Uh, the utility of administrative claims, their um, sort of up and downsides, and trying to move the field forward. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Today the title is uh, Administrative Claims for Clinical Research. Are we ready for prime time? And much of what the examples that I'll give will be will involve the device space, because that's where I spend a lot of my time um, focusing. But the lessons that we've learned there are directly um, translatable into the drug space uh, as well. So. As we, uh, as we go through this, we'll talk about what are these administrative claims. For people who haven't worked with them before, I think the idea of understanding the data better, if you understand the data, you can actually understand its strengths and weaknesses and learn how to move it forward um, in an intelligible way. Why, uh, why would we use a system of claims-based follow-up, and what are the strengths and weaknesses? And then finally, I'll give you a summary slide on at least my thoughts, one person's thoughts on uh, are these uh, claims data ready for prime time? And in which applications uh, do we need more work? So uh, this is no secret to anybody in this room, but product development in the United States is, is increasingly slow and expensive. The cost per new medical product is going up. The number of approvals is going down. This has meant significant delays in innovation in our country, and our patients are feeling it. And that's a problem. A large portion of the cost of uh, clinical research, this is late phase clinical research, the relative cost, a large portion of it is in data acquisition and data management. And we know that. This is directly from our data here at the DCRI. And so we built an entire industry, an entire system around the idea that uh, data that's good enough for clinical purposes is not good enough for clinical research. And to me, that makes no sense. And so. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that today. We've designed additional study visits for patients. We've designed duplicative data entry systems for data to get into our, uh, into our uh, clinical trial data collection forms. And at the end of this, we end up inconveniencing patients and we end up increasing their likelihood of security breaches, et cetera. 
And it's made me and others wonder, where's the patient in this mix? And is it even ethical? I think we're going to get to that point. Is it even ethical to collect data that's non-essential data elements? Is it ethical to collect that data um, when we know that it's inconveniencing patients and putting them at risk? But over the last decade, we've had a tremendous transformation in medicine from paper charts, those of us who um, are in this room with white coats remember times when uh, we started practice uh, with paper charting and not long ago transformed an entire industry to digital charting. And this transformation has opened up opportunities for us to think about the world in different ways, for us to uh, revamp regulatory um, decisions that may lead us or give us the opportunity to actually uh, innovate on uh, operational side of clinical trials and maybe get to this idea of a truly pragmatic clinical trial. And so the digital revolution, I think, has really given us an opportunity to recenter product development, finally putting the patient back at the center of uh, clinical investigation where they belong. It's a vision. This is a vision of using available data from multiple sources, uh, including uh, hospitalizations, outpatient visits, ambulance care, pharmacy records, eventually uh, implantable devices, all of this feeding into a common data source making sense of that data and being able to track patients over time at very low cost. It's a vision. It's a vision. I think we'll get there, but it's a shared vision. A shared vision that others have talked about, we've talked about here, and I think really at the DCRI we should be proud of the advances that we've made in this field, and that's some of what we'll talk about today. So how do we get there? A mentor of mine at one point, who's uh, sitting in this room, uh, once said, we start with crawling. You take one step at a time. You crawl before you walk. You walk before you run. And if there's low-hanging fruit, take it. So the first step in this arena of many steps is, say, PCI. This is a trial that was conducted here. Sunil Rao uh, was the lead uh, on this. Connie Hess, who's here, and Mitch Krukoff. Many of the people in this room contributed to this effort. The idea was using existing clinical registry data to try and reduce the amount of data that had to go into case report forms. And as a result of this effort in this trial, an estimated 60% reduction in the sites uh, effort expended in collecting data. A tremendous advance, a tremendous advance in clinical research. The next step uh, is a model. The next step is a addressing the follow-up, clinical follow-up of patients. And this is one of the models that's been promoted and that we've promoted. And the idea is using what we've learned from Safe PCI to collect baseline case report form data tagging that on to a mechanism of follow-up. They've done this with uh, Translate now, with uh, Tracy sitting here, and in their program, they've done this um, for follow-up of those patients, administrative data linked to clinical data to allow us to follow these patients over time using administrative data. But to understand this model and the efficiencies that this model can give us, we have to understand administrative data. And so that's what we're going to spend a couple of minutes doing here is understanding administrative data a little bit better, hopefully not uh, so much that I put you to sleep. So we'll start with a quiz, maybe a little uh, audience uh, interaction here. So this is a multiple choice question. What are administrative claims data? And by show of hands, if you don't mind, um, can you tell me, those who think that it's uh, the claims data that we get are medical bills paid, that would be A, medical bills invoiced by whoever's doing the service, a reflection of medical services rendered, all the above, or it depends. So um, for A, for B, for C, B, a B, a couple uh, for C, D, all the above, got a couple, and it depends, E, right? So you guys have taken multiple choice questions before, right? So if I give you a, a possibility of it depends, that's usually right, and it is the correct answer here. Generally, when we're talking about Medicare claims, we're talking about bills paid. So bills paid by Medicare, that's what shows up in our Medicare claims. And um, that should be a reflection of the bills invoiced. 
and also a reflection of medical services rendered. The two don't always equate, but that's the first thing to know about claims. So where do those claims come from? Dr. Peterson's sitting here, so I thought that I would show a picture of him giving excellent clinical care. I was one of his fellows in clinic and had the great opportunity to work with him in clinic. So Dr. Peterson sees a patient in clinic. In our current system, Dr. Peterson uh, bills that patient encounter directly into the EHR and it goes to the claims department at Duke and some magic happens and then it gets filed with our regional Medicare carrier. In other systems and systems before our current EHR, the clinical note that was filed would be abstracted. That abstraction would be done by data managers who would then file a claim with our regional affiliate. The regional affiliate then is responsible for paying or denying that claim and then they pass their records on to CMS in Washington. And at CMS uh, in DC, they compile those records and make a big warehouse. They have a warehouse of data. That warehouse of data, they then send it on to ResDAC and the vast majority of the um, data that we have for clinical research purposes um, comes from ResDAC. But others have access to it in other ways. So federal agencies, the CDC, you may or may not know, uses Medicare claims data almost real time. Within two weeks, they use Medicare claims data to track things like flu epidemics, the CDC does. So governmental agencies, um, as well as some uh, independent contractors, RTI has a direct feed of data from Medicare, and then some groups like the STS-ACC uh, transcatheter valve therapies registry get that data directly. And so this is where the data comes from. What is the data? Uh, what are the data? The Medicare claims data are just a series of codes. This is from a coding uh, book that I have on my shelf in my office, right? This is an old version. This is 2010. It's a big, thick book. And if you want to look up um, what is the code for an acute MI 410, and then it has lots of different modifiers that go with it. Similarly, if you want to look up a procedure, for example, a drug-eluting stent, placement, so what I was doing yesterday, then um, you could go here and find, um, find the correct code for it. And so Medicare bills are all codes. They're all codes and series of codes and code numbers. And when we talk about them, this is what we're talking about. But because they're codes, they're a common language. And that's part of the beauty of administrative claims for research is that you're dealing in a common language worldwide. So this is a map of where this is ICD-10. Uh, codes have been implemented worldwide. We're still in this country on ICD-9. There are cross-links between the two, but a large portion of the world has incorporated, at least developed countries have incorporated ICD coding system uh, as their own billing system. Um, so we have the ability uh, to track these codes and could use it as a standardized definition. So we talk about standardizing definitions for endpoint spheres. This is one of the beauties of administrative claims. So once you know what claims are, then we have to take those claims and we have to link them back to a patient. You can't do that. Medicare doesn't send us the patient name and you're not allowed by law to link claims data directly to a patient's name. So we link them to clinical records and that's where their utility really comes from for the applications that we're gonna talk about today. How do we do that linkage? The current state of the art is called a deterministic linkage and it's just using characteristics that are available in clinical sources, characteristics that are available in claims data and matching the two. So this is the analogy that maybe helps get you there. If we start in the universe, and we work our way down. Uh, you match on sex and then age, a patient's admission discharge date, their hospital, finally their date of birth. You don't have that patient's name because that is firewalled off from research um, personnel. But you can identify a patient almost exactly with this information. You imagine how many 85-year-olds who were born on August the 5th um, who are men who were admitted and discharged from a certain hospital uh, with a certain sex, you can, you can get to the patient. So that's the beauty of this, is that you can get to the information on the patient, the data, without knowing the identity of the patient. 
And that's where this is, uh, is really a powerful tool. This is a methodology that was, um, that was published by Brad Hamill and the group in CCGE here and has been further developed over time. Um, to allow this, we get to about 80% of records linked, depending on how you uh, count, the, uh, count the records, is it eligible records or all records, et cetera, et cetera. The, the rates may be slightly different from database to database. So what are administrative claims and what can't they do for me? So they're not going to make me the president of the United States or you. They're not going to even make us the president of the hair club for men. Um, and for those of us who are more altruistic, they're not going to solve world hunger. Um, but what will they do? What can they do? There are a number of potential applications, all of which we hope will allow us to do what brings us to work every day, hopefully, which is to bend this curve and to bend it more quickly than otherwise we could have. So deaths due to heart disease uh, and in other fields, can we decrease the prevalence and the incidence of disease and the adverse effects of those disease over time? These are the research applications, some of which we, some of the research applications that we've used claims for in this building, and I'll show you some examples of those, including claims-based performance goals, allowing uh, devices to develop performance goals against which they can be uh, judged, uh, and therefore increase efficiencies, label extensions and post-approval studies, real-world comparative effectiveness or safety and effectiveness, analyses and automated safety surveillance really uh, as the horizon of what we are involved in actively now. So some examples, this is an example from the STS registry um, that Sean O'Brien and I and a team of people including Eric uh, Peterson in this room and others um, have used Medicare claims, excuse me, linked with uh, the STS database to uh, generate curves of expected incidents of bad stuff happening. So this is uh, reoperation, and uh, in each of these panels, you see for different device categories, aortic bioprostheses, for example, mitral bioprostheses, mechanical aortics, mitral mechanicals, we can give expected rates or expected incidents of reoperation by devices. Then we can look across the devices that we have. And we can see how do the devices that are on the market, the most popular forms of these valves that are getting put in our parents and grandparents, how are they performing? And we, when we did this analysis of the 12 market leaders, five of those underperformed by regulatory standards, two times the objective performance criteria. Five of the 12 had higher reop rates than uh, the market, than what the average would be. Now that should bother you. It bothers me, it bothers me, and we're getting to a system where we can do this more and can actually understand over time the performance of these valves. We haven't had that opportunity without administrative claims because we've had no way to globally follow these patients over time. What about label extension? So this is the next uh, extension of this. Once you form performance criteria, you can use this data claims link data to uh, get to areas that weren't studied in the clinical trials. So um, labels, uh, indications for devices or medications that perhaps you would expect to be safe, but there's no data to guide it. Uh, the FDA has recently, this was a year ago, year and a half ago, um, allowed a label extension for the uh, transcatheter aortic valve device um, based on registry data linked with administrative claims. What about comparative effectiveness or comparative safety and effectiveness research? We've got lots of examples of that. People in this room um, have led as many or more, probably more than I have. This is an example of um, an analysis that we did, again, with mechanical versus bioprosthetic valves, showing what you would expect with the Medicare claims as your mechanism of follow-up. And over time, what we saw is that uh, patients who were treated with bioprosthetic valves tended to do worse, and they did worse as their reop rates were increasing. And that's what you'd expect. This was, uh, this was data that you would expect. But in sample sizes, rather than two to 400 or 1,000 at max in this field, this is 40,000 patients. It allows tremendous precision, and we'll talk about that 
trade-off between precision and accuracy that um, comes of issue with claims. What about post-marketing surveillance? After the drug-eluting stent thrombosis days, there was a call for the use of administrative claims as a mechanism of surveillance. Terry sitting here has mentioned um, putting in UDIs into the claims uh, databases, unique device identifiers. Lots of, um, lots of movement in this area with the MD EpiNet, uh, public-private partnership, and other uh, groups trying to integrate claims for device surveillance. This is an example, again, from the STS registry where we have done just that, developed and implemented an active surveillance system, shown that it can be done within a platform that starts with clinical registries linked to administrative claims for long-term follow-up. But at times, although I've shown you the house that we've built, building that house has been a parallel project with building the foundation. And that makes for some tricky business. So um, the foundation, the validity of claims, the underpinning of this field has been developed as we've been implementing these, uh, this new technology and the new abilities because we want to see um, how patients are doing over time. So we have moved ahead with building the house while we're building the foundation. Foundational pieces and maybe the Achilles heel, which we'll spend some time talking about of administrative claims, um, are really threefold. The most notable being accuracy, timeliness, and their ability to be a ubiquitous form of data to allow us to see across a population. And we'll talk about each of those, so let's, let's tackle them. The idea of big data, and this goes for all big data, not just claims, the concern, I think, in people's mind is that without specific data managers entering or study coordinators entering this information, um, it may be that you have garbage coming into the system, and garbage in, garbage out. And this is something that was highlighted by uh, Mike Lauer in his New England Journal uh, article this past year. And I think a concern of all of ours, you know, when Eric puts that information into uh, the, uh, the EHR system, he has great knowledge of the patient. Um, and he probably more than anybody has knowledge of the claim system and how to do it, but most of us don't have a great understanding of how to apply that book that I showed you and the coding definitions. The alternative, data managers put in codes and they have no knowledge of what happened in the interaction with the patients. And that's concerning because you either have people who know the coding system or who know the patients and never the twain shall meet. And the concern again is that you end up with garbage, garbage in, garbage out. So what claims get you, claims data gets you, is the ability to reach into, well, it gets you a lot of things, but the ability to reach into cohorts that otherwise you could not have studied. And expand the size of your cohort tremendously is one of the things that you can get from this with very efficient mechanism of following patients. That leads to great precision. So on the right side, on the left side of this, slide, great precision, and your golf shots. The problem is if you have biased data or if you have garbage for data, you end up with great precision but very poor accuracy. Or worst case, like my golf game, you end up with poor precision and poor accuracy. Not as much of a concern with claims, more concern with claims is your accuracy. And that's what we focused a lot of our effort on. So how much of an issue is that? This is an analysis that we did from uh, the STS database. The top um, pie graph uh, here was from an article that was published in 2008 that said that from 1991 to 2003, of the Medicare recipients receiving aortic valves, 36% of them received bioprostheses. That's a little odd because these are old people. Old people tend to get myoprostheses. That flies in the face of what we know clinically. If you look over a similar time period, what you see in the STS database, which tracks device type much more closely, is that actually it wasn't 36%. It was 62%. So a 30% difference in your exposure, exposure misclassification, those of 
you have spent time in epidemiology or in research, all of us in this room know that exposure misclassification biases you generally toward the null, and that's what we see. What we see when we compare results of the claims on the top with the arrows versus the claims linked clinical registries where we think we got it right is that when you have exposure misclassification, you end up biased toward the null, and that's what they showed in that manuscript, and we subsequently showed by using a clinic, clinical database, the STS, linked with administrative claims. So there is some inaccuracy in exposure identification. Perhaps implementation of unique device identifiers with Medicare claims would get us beyond that, but right now, using claims alone for exposure uh, identification um, is, I would say, probably not appropriate until you further validated that use. And we know that it matters what algorithm you use. So Brad's work and the CCGE's work, our work in the building of developing these linkage mechanisms, the algorithms matter. And this is an example of a study, drug eluting versus bare metal stents, that we did with uh, Dr. Douglas um, and Dr. Peterson and showed that, um, that it does matter. Where you set your linkage rules matters in your analysis outcomes. But what we know also matters, and this is true of anybody who's been involved in clinical trials in here, we know that definitions, data definitions matter, right? We've seen examples recently when you re-adjudicate a trial by a new definition, you may get a completely different answer. We've seen that. Data definitions matter. That also is the case in administrative claims. So for each of the endpoints that we think about in cardiovascular disease or in any disease space, let's say MI, stroke, heart failure, there are multiple different groups of people who think they know what is the best group of those codes to put together to find the most accurate answer. Does it matter? Well, of course it matters, as we would expect. This is two different, these are two different definitions. This is one that we used at Duke for our DECIDE projects. This is one that's been used by the OMOP and many Sentinel group for ischemic stroke. And you see that the incidence rates over time when you use these two definitions, all we're doing is changing the codes that we're looking for in Medicare. That's all we've done here. Same cohort, just change the codes that we're looking for. Drastically different answers. But when you compare therapies, when you compare therapies, not as much of a difference because we expect that that misclassification of endpoints is non-differential. So your relative difference may not be a big deal, but your instance rate is a big deal. If you're dealing on a relative scale, you're in great shape, perhaps. If you're dealing on an absolute scale, um, you've got some big problems. And as we design implementations of this in trials and in registries, et cetera, um, this is one of the lessons that we have to keep in mind. So the question that we asked was, well, which one's right? Right now we know they're different. Which one's right? And the FDA funded us to look into this. This is a, uh, some slides from a presentation that I gave at uh, QCOR this past year. This is a project that we've been working on um, for the last two years um, and was, uh, was my first grant award from the FDA, a U01 that we worked on, a large team, collaborative team, both of Duke investigators as well as investigators from the FDA, a very interested and involved group at the FDA, and um, investigators outside of the FDA, including Sharon Lease, uh, Norman, Tom, Sai, and Joe Ross, um, who have been very involved and active in this work and in this area. And for this investigation, the question we asked was, which of these groups of codes was, is the most accurate when you compare it to a clinical trial, CEC adjudicated, what we think as the gold standard. Now, I'll give you some evidence here in a minute to maybe make us question that gold standard. But what do we think as the gold standard? I think most in the business would consider CEC adjudicated clinical trial results as the gold standard. And which of those groups of codes worked best? And that's what we did. We linked uh, using that determinat de deterministic linkage algorithm. We used the sort of most precise version of that algorithm that we had, so our linkage rates were lower than typical. But we linked four large acute coronary syndrome trials that we had in-house 
to Medicare claims and uh, had a pooled cohort of 3,200 patients, Medicare patients that had long-term follow-up. And then we could look at six, six months. How did Medicare claims do considering clinical trials as our gold standard? How did Medicare claims do for death and rehospitalization? And the answer is for sensitivity, for specificity, for positive and negative predictive value, claims do a tremendous job when compared to what I'm going to call here the alloy or gold standard of um, clinical trials. What about for our less hard, if you will, endpoints or some of our other endpoints, revascularization, MI, heart failure, and stroke, you can see a pattern here. That the sensitivity and the positive predictive value of claims in this context was not as good, about 70%. Focusing on MI, what we saw was about, again, about 70% sensitivity, so we missed a number of claims is what it, a number of events is what it looks like here on first blush. But our event rates, our event rates are almost identical, which is interesting. How does that happen? How does that happen? Well, it turns out that the patients that are picked up in Medicare are different than the patients that are picked up in clinical trials. So of the 88 events that clinical trials found an event in, those four clinical trials, of the 88 of those events, 26 of those, 26 of those, Medicare, an additional 26 Medicare found, and of the 88 that Medicare found, an additional 26 the trials found. So there was disagreement on a third nearly of the patients that were classified as having an MI. There was a disagreement between claims and trials. Now that may all be because trials are just better. It may also be because when we lose contact with a patient, we lose the ability to follow them over time, and Medicare claims do not lose that ability. They're able to follow those events over time. And so we saw additional deaths, for example, in claims data that weren't picked up in the trials. And so Medicare claims as a supplement to clinical trial CEC, or as a, as a surrogate for, or as a supplement to um, that data, I think there are two different ways you can see this. And this is, uh, this is research that continues, uh, is still ongoing. We, these are some of our conclusions from that study that subtle differences in the coding algorithms do actually affect the sensitivity and positive predictive value specifically of Medicare claims for event detection. The, the group of codes matters. Substantial number of events are detected by Medicare but not reported in the trials. And despite differences in event detection, Overall event rates, at least in this context, were similar. Begs a number of other questions, which both a sub-study of the NIH C-Core as well as a Burroughs Welcome Foundation Innovation and Regulatory Sciences Award that we've recently won, will go on to fund over the next several years to answer more of these questions and try and build, again, the foundation as we build the house. So what about timely? data. For those in the back who can't read this, this is someone from the government who says, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you and he's talking to a tombstone. So what about timeliness of the data um, right now? An issue with claims data, at least as it comes from ResDAC, we wait at least 18 months, up to two years or more for that data to be, pro those data to be processed and to get back to us for use, that's a problem, right? If you're running a clinical trial and the DSMB is meeting and they can't figure out whether any events occurred until after the trial's done enrolling, that's a problem. On the surveillance side, device surveillance or drug surveillance side, uh, you're trying to track a new device and a couple years after that device comes on the market, let's say five years later, you're two years lag, you see a problem, the company has already moved on to a new iteration. Tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of patients have already been treated with that device during that time that we were waiting for the data to be processed and to come to us. So how do we solve that problem? One potential solution for this was released a year, year and a half ago, and this is the Virtual Research Data Center. The VRDC is an attempt by Medicare to get that data to us faster and to consolidate, I suppose, who's using that data. And the VRDC um, works something like this. You have seats. 
You have seats, virtual seats. People who uh, on their computers can patch into that warehouse of data from, the, uh, from Medicare. And they pay money uh, to have that. The DCRI is one of those places where we have a seat. In the future, what we may be able to do is input direct identifiers, put them into the sandbox in a secure location with patients, and have Medicare do a direct link using direct identifiers to administrative claims data, give us back their claims data as they accrue, as they accrue those claims so we can follow patients directly over time as that data accrues. And that would allow us two things. It would get, a, get around the linkage problem, losing 20% of our patients to the linkage. It would also get us more real-time access to the data to allow us to actually use claims in applications like trials and device surveillance. So does anybody know what this is? Just shout it out if you do. Retina. Yes, it's a retina. So does anybody know what the big spot in the middle is? There we go. So you guys clearly are not cardiologists who ever just said that. So because I haven't seen an optic nerve since I was in med school. So. Um, the optic nerve is where right, the blood supply and the nerve supply comes out, and it is the blind spot. It is the blind spot. So what's the blind spot of administrative claims? The blind spot is patients who aren't enrolled in fee-for-service administrative claims, at least for Medicare data. There are other types of administrative claims, so that includes patients under 65, uh, patients who are not in fee-for-service, patients who are HMO, um, patients who are governmental hospitals, a number of patients it doesn't pertain to. So if we're going to miss those patients, how can this be applicable? There are some potential solutions for that. One of them is the state all-payer claims databases. There are, at last count, somewhere between 15 and 20 or so states that either have implemented or are in the steps of implementing a state all-payers claims database. And this is where People who file bills, who file charges in the medical system, are required by the state, by statutory rules, um, to then give that data uh, to these uh, state all-payer claims databases. And these can be used for research purposes. That reaches into patients who are under 65, patients who are not fee-for-service. So potentially, because um, it's not just Medicare patients that we I'll bills on, I don't think. So um, this gives us access to any point in time, potentially in the future, that any patient is touching uh, the medical system, which is the goal. So are claims uh, ready for prime time? They told me I should allow some t time for questions, so I'm going to try and wrap it up here in just a second. So this is my, my answer to that question. Uh, for performance goals, Medicare-based performance goals that then you can uh, compare against using a cohort registry, single arm registry that's linked to Medicare. Are they ready for performance goals? In my mind, the answer is yes. Not a problem there. Label extensions and post-approval studies, I think the answer for most applications there, it depends on the design, but for most applications, I would say uh, the answer is yes. Comparative effectiveness research, we've done it. The answer there is yes. Safety surveillance, I think we're close, but I think we need to get that virtual research data center um, to the next step where we can actually put in the direct identifiers and get data back more quickly. So timely data access is what we're working on to really make that a more real-time reality for device surveillance so that those five of 12 um, valve prostheses that were underperforming, we don't have to find that out five, ten years later than otherwise we could have. Community-based interventions, again, timely data access um, would be uh, key. In that case, one community cluster gets intervention A, another community cluster gets intervention B. We track how their Medicare patients are doing over time. Very easy way um, to test therapeutics. And then finally, late, late phase clinical trials. I think we do have some challenges here. Timely data access. Um, what we, we are currently engaged in and our team is currently engaged in, which is endpoint validation, and uh, the need really in a trials world, I think, for direct data linkage. 
So in summary, the existing system of medical uh, product development is slow, it's expensive, it's ineffective, it's hurting our patients actively, it needs to be solved. The digitization of clinical records allows us an opportunity to reform regulatory statutes and allows us as a community to rethink how we design clinical research. The integration of clinical and administrative data sources creates an opportunity to advance this field, but critical foundational work is undergoing and needs to be followed up. And so where we are, a philosophy, right? This is a philosophy, great philosophy by Martin Luther King Jr., which is a statement that faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. So should we invest time, talent, dollars toward development of this field, I would argue yes. The potential here for efficiencies to allow large-scale conduct of clinical research that can bend that curve is tremendous. And others have agreed. And so this is a thank you slide. The US FDA CDRH, FDA U01 that we work under, the NIH CCOR dollars, the Burroughs Welcome most recent grant the Duke Division of Cardiology that supported me and others, and the Duke Clinical Research Institute that gives us not just support financially, but also uh, access to great minds like those in this room. So, thank you. Great, thanks. That was very thought provoking. Any questions for Matt? Yes, sir. The, uh you come through uh, a training program like you did in, uh, in cardiology and you're on the faculty and you are doing this kind of research. How does this kind of work that you're doing translate for you into something which is a role on the at Duke, a role in the Duke faculty? Is it cardiology? Is it broader? I mean, how does this relate to the actual faculty role that you're moving toward or you're in? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Galen, I would say that this, um, this research allows me um, to, on a global level, uh, influence, influence the field that I'm in by maybe making it easier in the future to develop products. How does it influence my um, place on the faculty? Well, it's, um, I'll, let others, I'll let others speak to that maybe. Um, but I will say that the support that we get coming through training here, um, my ability to study um, this area, my ability to train with people who understand these data better than I ever will, my ability to implement them um, down the road, to have access to the people who can make this difference, to be able to call up um, the guys at CMS and say, or the folks at CMS and say, this is where we'd love to take it, can you help us get there? Or talk to the folks at registries who can help us uh, actually implement or have the ears of people in the drug and device industry to start to implement some of this research. Our ability to get dollars for grants, um, all of that has been tremendous. My, how has this helped my uh, faculty and promotions? Uh, I've had no promotions and I don't, I'm not on faculty actually here at the DCRI anymore. So. Uh, you, you raised the issue uh, in an environment like this of trying to understand the gold standard. So on the one hand, as in, in any comparison of infrastructures, it's always easier to list toward the one that's uh, logistically ultimately easier and less expensive to work with. Yep. I think we've all been through in debates about definition A versus definition B. Sometimes it's more important to use a system that gives you consistent application of a definition rather than really wrestle with the difference in accuracy of definition A versus B. But at the end of the day, I think the, the real question here is how do you understand gold standards enough to either say this is good enough and claims data gives us this long-term follow-up to the degree that we can make it efficient and timely, this is good enough. Yeah. Or, how do you come down saying this is not good enough? It's yeah. too erratic, there's Medicare fraud, there are all sorts of other ways that 
information can enter this system, and we should stay with clinical trials and just battle through yeah. doing. So, how do you come to a determination of what you use as a gold standard and what is good yeah. enough? It's a it's a good question. You know, hopefully this um, that was the you maybe heard parts of this mentioned and know well enough what I was trying to get you to, which was a, a deeper question of um, what is good enough. And, and understanding, you know this better than probably many of us in this room, that for different applications, good enough may be different. The bar may be set differently. So for, uh, as you've said many times, the tenth device in an area um, approval of that device, your bar or drug, your bar is going to be lower than for the first in an area. So I think um, your standard is different as you go through. But how do you establish a gold standard is a good question. Our next steps, one of the next steps that we have planned, um, this will be funded from the Burroughs Welcome um, Foundation uh, dollars will be going back to those 52 cases where there was disagreement for MI and where we have the clinical re records available seeing what happened in those cases. I think that's going to give us shed tremendous light on are we missing them or, or are those cases simply ones that were adjudicated as no and that'll help us understand um, the problem more. So that's my answer to you is you have to go back to the source documents to validate, ultimately. You can't get back to that point in time, but the source documents can help give you some glimmer of which is the gold standard and what exactly is the reason for the discrepancies. And that's part of our grant, one of the aims of our grant for the Burroughs Welcome Innovation and uh, Regulatory Sciences Award. Yeah, John. So, Matt, fabulous talk and very um, provocative um, topic. I have a, have a couple uh, question and, and a comment. Um, so, and I'll, I'll do them all at once and we can answer them. So, um, <laughs> as, as for to, they're, they're, they're relatively uh, straightforward. So, <laughs> you, you are worried about um, absolute rates in these data. Okay. And yet, your first uh, place where you said medical games uh, data were ready for prime time is using them against per, uh, you know, objective performance criteria, yeah, which is exactly where absolute rates would matter. Yep. Um, and then you, you, I think, pointed out, and I, I agree, that for, for relative differences, it matters less because you'll have error, but presumably your error is equal across two uh, compared groups. And this is exactly what we have always talked about in the clinical events uh, adjudication community, is that it's more important to be, to be blinded that's which, right. Uh, and systematic. That's right. Um, than be 100 percent accurate. Right. Um, uh, and so I, I think um, that's where I, I think that's the argument that one has to use to use these data yeah. uh, to use uh, this as an approach for a, a comparative evaluation yeah. across projects. Yeah. And then the last point, which is a comment, is that you know when we when we meaning mostly Ken Mahaffey was trying to sort out justify using clinical event adjudicated data versus investigator reported endpoints. So he had the same, we had exactly the same kind of disagreement rates. And yep. what, what, he, what he did to try to figure out which events were more important is compare them to long-term mortality. Yep. So take those 26 patients that were missed in each direction and which group of events are more prognostically important for long-term outcomes. So Dr. Peterson is sitting here shaking his head because he's been trying to get me to do that analysis, so thank you. And the, the last thing is, I would say that one of the most compelling things I heard out of your talk was, you know, our, one of our biggest problems right now in the clinical trials world, world is loss to follow-up. Yep. And if you could simply eliminate loss to follow-up yep. or dramatically reduce it using Medicare claims data, then either as a supplement or as a replacement, um, they'd have value. Yep. No, absolutely, and that's claims as a supplement to rather than a surrogate for, Doc, give me just a second to address the first question, which was OPC. So objective performance criteria, performance goals, um, for those who've not worked with them, the um, industry makes an argument or the FDA sets um, a bar. Industry generally makes an argument that um, they should be able to have um, no more than X percent MI rate with their device or their drug, no more than X percent 
um, re uh, valve reoperation rate, rate with their valve. Um, and then they compare their uh, device or drug to that. And John, where I would say the problem is, and where the actually the nidus for this grant and this whole field of investigation, um, Eric and I were sitting in a meeting when I first came on faculty, and there was an industry sponsor who was suggesting that they take data and event rates drawn from a different mechanism and compare it to data and event rates that were drawn from administrative claims. And if at the end of the day, um, they didn't do worse than the administrative claims, then they would get their label extension. Now there's so many problems with that, which is what brought this up. So what I would say is in the world of OPCs, uh, objective performance criterion, or performance goals, you need to have a standard definition across both arms of uh, both your comparator, so your, um, your uh, cohort for, for which the OPC, from which the OPC was developed, and a uh, mechanism, administrative claims, and then compare that to, and only compare that to, registry data that's linked to administrative claims that use the same definition for ascertainment. And in that case, you get around, you get away from the differences that are just due to definition. And you get to the differences that are due to the device. That's right. And so that's the only place where you can use it. So when I say used as OPCs, I say used as OPCs against which administrative claims OP, uh, um, follow up of drugs or devices cohorts can be compared. And maybe that, hopefully, that answered your question. Doc, sorry, or others. My concern with the matching on the clinical trials, the slide showed as low as 52% match on one of those trials. Are the folks who didn't match different from the ones who did match? Yeah, it's a great question. The answer is generally no. We used, um, we used linkage algorithms, and that's why I pointed that out, that gave us 50, 60% um, linkage rates. Because, um, so we used overly precise, what many would consider overly precise linkage rules, because in this setting, any um, mismatch would lead to error, would make it look like it was more of a problem than it really was. So we wanted to be absolutely certain that there was a linkage. But even when you get to 80%, let's say you get to our standard linkage rules and you have 80% linkage rates, what about those other 20%? You've just invested time and dollars into getting them treatment and now you're not following them. Are they different? Are they different is one of the questions. Generally, the answer is no. But in some settings, it may be a smaller deal, population-wide surveillance, population-wide comparative effectiveness studies, whereas in other settings, clinical trials, it may be a bigger deal, which is part of the reason why I said for clinical trial platforms, I think we have to get to the place where we can have a direct for most clinical trial pr platforms, we have to get to a place where we can have a direct uh, linkage, not using deterministic linkage, but rather using direct identifiers. So in, f in conclusion here, um, it's, it's, this has kind of a, been a, a trip down memory lane. Um, one of my first talks I ever gave was uh, administrative data of gold mine of fool's gold. Um, that was 20 years ago. Uh, and I'm not 100% sure that we still know the answer to that question. Um, I would say that your talk has shown how much we've learned, um, how much we still have to learn. Um, the potential there is, is absolutely obvious. If those have missed it in the audience, um, you've missed it. Uh, because there's a lot of remarkable potential here to augment, supplement, um, uh, change how we look at the results of clinical trials. The one part of this is frustrating um, is that a lot of the knowledge that are on these beautiful slides still haven't been translated. I have to say that since I gave you brief last night an email, I'll do it publicly too. Um, <laughs> you need to get this data out. You need to finish answering these questions and then we as an organization need to act on those examples and, and make examples of those in real world um, trials so that we can actually test this out fully. The, the final question I have for you, or not even a question, it's just sort of a statement of where we're going, is partly the reason why maybe fewer people showed up is because you used the word claims. 
if you would have substituted the word EHR, um, truthfully, EHR is going to run into the exact same problems you're running into here. In what settings can that EHR data supplement for what we would have done for trial data, for data collection, for follow-up, et cetera? The exact same set of problems Absolutely. exist here. CEC, you've already given an example, is exactly that same problem. How much can we just allow the investigator or the patient uh, in the future to report events versus verification on uh, yep. you know, complete uh, accuracy ascertainment? Yep. So the exact same methodologies you're talking about here are going to permeate the next 20 years going forward. Absolutely. So we might as well get it right once. Yeah, no, I agree. Thank you for the, uh, for the summary comments. The slide that I had that was garbage in, garbage out, I moved the word EHR and put in the word big data. <laughs> they are the same lessons, and I think that's what informs us moving forward. So thank you. And thank you, Optel, for inviting me. Thanks.